Okay, welcome everyone to today's uh, special forum on law enforcement records management brought to you by the New York State Archives. A special thanks to the Municipal Police Training Council for helping organize this event. My name is Dennis Riley, and I am the State Archives Regional Advisor for the Hudson Valley School. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jennifer O'Neill, who is the head of our attention scheduling unit, among others. I also want to thank the folks for completing the pre-session survey. The results were... Hey, hey Dennis. Yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but we're getting a little feedback on your end. Office each Tuesday and, and Wednesday, however that may vary. Should you need assistance now? Um, okay. Uh, how, that's, how that's, that? that's, that's better. Okay, I'll just lean into my uh, computer. Um, and folks, if you can just ensure that your microphones are muted, I have uh, repeatedly uh, clicked the mute all setting, but uh, apparently that is not sticking. Um, and on with the show. I, I just wanted to uh, sort of note the results of the survey were interesting to us. It seemed like a majority of you know about or are engaged in records management and retention and disposition, but uh, perhaps the role and the services of the state archives might not be as well known. So hopefully today's session can be the start of a productive dialogue. Um, so today's roadmap, if I can advance the slide, uh, this is what we're going to cover. We'll talk a bit about the importance of records management and where retention and disposition fit into this and uh, highlight some good or best practices regarding uh, disposition. We have a whole other webinar dedicated just to retention and disposition, so we'll only touch on the highlights today. But again, as, as I noted, it's a great opportunity to emphasize uh, good practices when it comes to law enforcement records management and why it's important. We'll discuss the structure of the new schedule, um, as well as a little bit about what has changed and what hasn't changed, and we'll highlight some selected series of records and specific retention items that you should be aware of. This is not a comprehensive review of all changes. In fact, it uh, focuses mostly on public safety and probation, so more administrative type changes, uh, fiscal human resources and the like won't necessarily be co covered. Uh, to some extent, what has changed will impact each of you differently, and we do have a summary of all the major changes posted on our website that provides more details. Uh, we hope to have ample time to answer questions at the end. Uh, so if you are expecting to discuss something or have specific questions, please enter that in the chat, and we'll try to address everyone's needs. I would note one of the issues that was raised in the survey was whether or not we were going to cover state police or SUNY law enforcement records. Uh, not today. Those uh, records are actually covered by different schedules. So today is really just focused on the new local government records schedule. And you may be asking yourself, what is that? Well, the local government retention schedule is developed by the state archives in conjunction with state oversight agencies and local governments. We're not just sitting in Albany trying to figure out how to create more work for you. Um, it sets out the minimum time period records need to be retained before they can be legally disposed of. And as part of the development process, we review laws, regulations, audit requirements, and other policy factors to ensure any retention period satisfies legal, fiscal, and your business needs, as well as identifying records that have enduring value. And that's where having a dialogue and a conversation with the law enforcement community is really important and helpful to us to understand what records you're creating, how you're creating them, and what your business needs are. The retention schedule is media neutral. So it applies to records in any format, whether paper, electronic, or microfilm. And it applies to the official copy of record. So duplicates are just that, duplicate copies. And I get the question about paper versus electronic at least once a week, usually sometimes more than once a day. 
In fact, I had that question come up just yesterday. And it's a seemingly simple question with uh, multiple complex answers. So it's a great opportunity to have a conversation with uh, others in your local government that have records management responsibilities as well as engage with the state archives to explore your options and what solution might work for you. But briefly, and I emphasize briefly, uh, while there is no requirement to retain paper versions of records, if you have an electronic version, there are some important questions and considerations to account for before declaring the electronic version as the official version or beginning, say, a, a digitization project. So while electronic records provide certain benefits and flexibility, they also represent a significant commitment on your part towards the future information technology capabilities and your commitment to uh, maintaining and providing access to those electronic copies. So again, while there are certain benefits in the 21st century to managing just electronic records, uh, in some respects you are just swapping out uh, considerations and factors when you're talking about paper versus electronic. The schedule also does not mandate destruction. Again, it just sets out the minimum period, but there are some very good reasons to regularly implement the schedule to ensure the efficient and effective functioning of your department. Uh, there are also some instances, such as legal proceedings or audits, where disposition needs to be suspended. It also does not mandate the creation of records. Just because a series is listed in the schedule does not mean you are required to create it. And the schedule also does not address all records management issues. Uh, retention and disposition are really just one piece of the larger records management puzzle. So why use it? Well, regular routine disposition of your records leads to greater efficiency and long-term cost savings. There are administrative dollars involved, whether you see it or not, in managing records. If you are only keeping what you need to keep, you have less to manage. Retrieval of records is improved. Responses to freedom of information requests or legal discovery is more efficient. And again, over the long run, you will save money in space when it comes to storage. And I would just say it is a fallacy that electronic records don't cost money and don't take up space. While storage and access issues are different for electronic records, left unchecked and unmanaged electronic records can result in significant headaches and costs. So adhering to the schedule will make sure that you're only devoting resources and time to the records you need to manage. And I would also push back against this notion that records management is one more thing. I don't have time. I have a real job to do. As public employees, as public officials, we all have records management responsibilities. And I like to think of it as muscle memory. You're already managing your records, and whether you are doing so efficiently or effectively really determines whether it's a burden or one more thing. Adhering to the schedule also helps you identify records that have permanent value, and statistics vary, but we often like to say only about 3 to 5 percent of government records are ever deemed permanent, which means the vast majority, 95 percent or more, of your records are likely to have a fixed lifespan. So we encourage you to get rid of them when you can. So routinely adhering to the schedule will make your work easier and allow you to devote those finite resources just to the records you need to maintain. And I was gratified to see that, um, according to the survey at least, over 80% of you already have policies and procedures in place, and over 70% of you are actively implementing disposition. There, there's a little disconnect between that 10% that are disposing but don't have policies, um, which is interesting to me. So 
consider this for those of you who have a really well-functioning disposition operation in, in place as, as a good refresher for those of you who, who might be struggling. Uh, here are just some high-level things to keep in mind. First, and perhaps most importantly, you do want to have written policies and procedures, uh, not just for your overall records management program, but also focusing on retention and disposition. And I noted from the survey the vast majority of law enforcement uh, entities are engaged in a decentralized records management environment, which is fine. But I would encourage you to always cooperate and consult and, and be on the same page with your local government's overall records management officer for villages and towns by law. That is the clerk for other local government entities. It might be someone else. But it's always helpful to make sure everyone is on the same page, whether your local government has a centralized or decentralized approach to records management. Um, and policies and procedures are a great way to make sure everyone understands what is expected and how things are working. And if they're not written to my mind, then they're not really policies or procedures. They're some sort of oral tradition that might get passed down and no one quite remembers how we got started doing what we're doing. But briefly speaking, the policy is the what, the general rule to be followed or the desired outcome. It's broad in scope. And the procedure is the how, the specific action or the established method for reaching that outcome. And so it's detailed and precise. Again, we have a whole other workshop that delves into the nitty gritty of records management policies and procedures. And we can offer templates or help you devise or revise uh, policies as needed. Uh, you can have two separate documents or a combined policy and procedure document. Again, it can be a broad overarching records management policy that lays out roles, responsibilities, and expectations. And then you can have a specific procedural document that details exactly how this position will be managed. To my mind, the format is really less important than ensuring you cover not only the basics of good records management, but any unique circumstances your agency might need to account for. And when applying the schedule and implementing retention and disposition, you first want to identify the record series you are dealing with and whether or not you are dealing with the official copy. Now, a record series is any group of similar records that are arranged according to a filing system or that are used in the same activity or function, such as purchasing files or accounts payable. And as I noted, retention requirements only apply to the official record copy. So duplicates kept for convenience or personal reference are just that, duplicates or non-record copies. Such re reference or convenience copies can be disposed of in accord with item 58 in the new schedule, which formerly was item 19 in the previous schedules. And it's important to understand what series you're dealing with, and hopefully you're only dealing with one series and not a jumble or mix of records, because the retention schedule is organized by functional sections, and these have remained largely the same in the LGS-1. So, for example, if you're dealing with banking records, you would look in the fiscal section, or for government-owned vehicles or equipment, you would look in the public property section. Um, Keep in mind that because the general schedule is meant to address the needs of every type of local government across New York State, our series uh, descriptions may be broad or not use the specific terminology you happen to use in your local context. So a guiding principle is to always make the best match in terms of the function for which the records are used. And we're providing access to the new schedule in a variety of formats. We're really excited to offer a web search feature, which hopefully I will successfully demonstrate in a few slides. It is a simple keyword search box that returns any item and then identifies the section that that item falls into. So if you don't get a good fit, you can always then navigate to the section and browse related items to see if there's a better match. 
that might not include your specific search term. It is also important to be consistent in your disposition activity. Uh, as I sort of alluded to, the benefits of being consistent include that you're ensuring only those records that need to be retained are retained and that they're disposed of promptly so that you're freeing up storage space and equipment and saving time in terms of retrieval and other management activities. It eliminates uh, potential costs for recovery in the event of, say, a fire or a flood with paper records or a server crash with electronic records. And it facilitates, again, identifying those permanent records that, and those vital records that are necessary for your day-to-day -day business functions, again, so that you're only devoting resources to those that you need to. Now, courts generally are not favorable to government entities that do not manage their records or fail to be consistent in their disposition activities. Courts are more likely to declare an adverse inference than be sympathetic to a local government whose disposition is erratic or not well documented. So having an annual or more frequent records management day where offices and staff are encouraged or even required to implement disposition is a good, easy first step. And documenting that disposition activity is equally important. Now, the State Archives does not require local governments to document disposition, but it is in your best interest to develop a destruction authorization form and a clear procedure to be followed to document records disposition. And that's, again, where cooperating with uh, your records management officer or your legal counsel and others in your local government can be very important. Such documentation is useful in demonstrating that you are consistent and disposing of records in accordance with the retention schedule rather than in an arbitrary or capricious manner. Again, we have a whole other workshop on the legal aspects of records management that goes into such issues in greater detail. And this is not just a plug for all the other training we can offer, but it's a good opportunity to highlight some very important issues. And finally, at any time in terms of retention, disposition, or records management in general, uh, if you have questions, if you need help, if you need a sounding board as you consider your options, Again, always feel free to contact your local government's official records management officer, but also uh, contact the State Archives. We have uh, myself and four colleagues who serve as regional advisors to local governments. Consider us your free consultant, your confidant, your main support to help you meet your records management obligations. We are not here to pass judgment. We don't report to anyone. And frankly, we have no real enforcement uh, authority, we are really here to help you make the best decisions uh, for your records management programs. One approach we highly recommend is that you develop what we refer to as office retention schedules, and we can offer templates and examples and help you craft ones that meet your needs. You know the records you deal with on a daily basis better than anyone else. Therefore, to my mind, you know which record series you need to focus on in terms of retention and disposition. Rather than navigating a 400-plus page schedule, frankly, with sections that have no bearing on law enforcement, you can create your own document or spreadsheet that includes only the series you deal with. And you can do this for your entire department, or if your department is big enough, you might have separate schedules for different offices. The office schedules are more concise and can identify series based on your own terminology or specific circumstances. They should still be linked to the appropriate items in the official schedule, but this is also where you can document any deviation from the minimum retention period if you choose to retain records longer, or if you decide to designate an electronic version as the official copy. The ultimate goal is to facilitate records management by all staff. Uh, an office schedule can also be the basis for the list of records 
required under the Freedom of Information Law. We have a um, fairly comprehensive publication on retention and disposition, which goes into greater detail on creating office schedules and how to implement them. And that's, again, where your regional uh, advisor can help you uh, to develop ones that meet your needs. And with that, I'm going to pass this on to Jennifer, who's going to talk about some special considerations. Great. So thank you for your survey responses. That Those help to inform the content of this slide. So first, uh, field records. We get this question a lot. And as you know, there are certain cases, uh, types of cases that are sealed, including those uh, that have a favorable disposition, those involving children, and certain violations and traffic infractions. The fact that the records are sealed and access to the information is restricted really has no effect on the retention of the records. You would simply follow the normal retention period outlined in for the appropriate item in the State Archives approved retention schedule. So, for example, for local governments, um, for investigations involving a juvenile where no arrest was made or no offense was committed, the record would be sealed and the retention is going to be uh, destroyed one year after the individual attains age 18. And obviously, you'll be keeping that record securely stored. Another question that came up uh, surrounded digital evidence. And let me preface this discussion by saying that I'm not an attorney, um, but I offer you my thoughts about rules of evidence and encourage you to seek specific legal advice from your legal counsel. Records that you create for administrative purposes during the normal course of your business may be used as evidence in a legal proceeding. So you should always create every record as if it could be potentially used for legal reasons. Certain of those records may be used and may be become evidence and have to go through additional, uh, more stringent protocols so first, let's talk about creating legally admissible digital records. Under existing federal and state rules of evidence, local governments and state agencies can use records produced by automated information systems. So those are systems created by computers, cameras, breathalyzers, radar equipment, and the list goes on and on to meet record-keeping requirements provided that the records are created in the normal course of business and their authenticity and reliability can be established. Establishing the authenticity and reliability of records depends on the accuracy of the process or system used to produce the record, the source of the information in the record, and the method and time of its preparation. And hopefully that is, timing is close to when the record was created. By carefully planning for new information systems, developing proper policies and procedures, and establishing controls like audit trails to monitor the accuracy and authenticity of data, and training staff, you can take advantage of new information technologies and limit your risk that your records will be lost, corrupted, or challenged. For those few records that may be used um, as evidence in legal proceedings, whether you've created them internally or you're receiving them from an external resource, um, there's additional requirements that must be followed to maintain the integrity of data to make sure that it is authentic and reliable. For law enforcement agencies that are accredited through the New York State Law Enforcement Accreditation Program, they should follow the standards for evidence and non-agency property management as outlined in the Standards and Compliance Verification Manual. And in it, it says that an agency should have a written directive that details its procedures for the collection, maintenance of chain of custody, 
documentation, classification, labeling, packaging, secure storage, transfer from and return to evidence storage, and disposition of all evidentiary and non-agency property within its custody. And that would be a good model for others to follow. Dennis has already talked at length about the disposition of records and evidence, um, but it, I think it's worth repeating that staff should regularly destroy law enforcement records according to State Archives approved retention schedules. Um, this could include anything from policies to procedures, correspondence, body camera footage, um, et cetera. This will reduce your legal risk and improve your efficiency in re retrieving records needed to do your work or to respond to requests. And having a retention schedule in place that's properly and regularly followed serves as legally satisfactory explanation as to why those documents could not be produced. And if you have ongoing or potentially or potential litigation, you need to suspend uh, destruction of records and hold on to them for at least the duration of the legal action. We know in the new local government schedule that law enforcement should retain documentary evidence, including video and audio recordings, as long as the corresponding case investigation file. And for the next versions of both our local government and state agency general schedules, we're going to um, more fully examine the retention and disposition of evidence, including evidence collected as part of the discovery process um, or um, subpoenaed, um, but not used in a case. So stay tuned on, uh, for that. Uh, we also received some questions about text messaging, emails, and social media. So any of those types of uh, files, messages, um, created using work issued, but also um, keep in mind that uh, this could include your personal accounts and that document official business are considered records. Official records must be managed in accordance with approved records retention schedules. But also keep in mind that many of these types of records may not be records because, as um, Dennis mentioned, they, they duplicate information that you may already have in a different uh, format, so they're essentially duplicates or non-records. Keep in mind um, that these are essentially means of communication or a type of format and not a record series per se. So you're not going to find an item in um, our retention schedule that say social media or text message. Instead, you need to look at the content of those messages and those web pages to identify the appropriate retention schedule item um, that would be based on the content. So based on the content, you may find that text messages or emails might be considered correspondence and could be covered under the correspondence item. Or you may find that they relate to a contract, so they would be kept under the uh, fiscal contract item. It's difficult to convince uh, cell phone and social media and email providers to enter into individualized service level agreements with local governments. Um, each provider um, retains the messages and related metadata for different retention periods, and those really vary, but they're generally quite short. Since the records may be records, your government should attempt to ensure that the records and their associated metadata are preserved long enough to satisfy retention and legal requirements. And if you're not able to put some sort of contract in place with those providers, then you may need to figure out another uh, means of preserving those uh, records, which may be something simple like saving a copy to 
shared folders on your network drive, to using a specialized application to capture the records, to using um, a document or case management, um, case files management system. And you may want to um, think about applying a, a broad retention period, so choosing the longest retention period for the email or the text message um, involved. That's going to make it much easier to apply um, and retention and disposition. We also got a question about forensic lab records. We don't have any items in the local government schedule that deal specifically with forensic labs associated with or that support law enforcement specifically, but we do have items in the public health section in the laboratory subsection of our local government schedule that cover forensic laboratory records and that you can use. The items range from administrative records to um, test results to equipment maintenance and repair records. If the records, if the items in this section um, or for state agencies, if your current agency specific schedules do not fully address the records that you possess, please let us know so we can add items to um, get retention schedules as needed. And then in the news a lot lately are disciplinary records. Um, again, this is another case where we don't have an item specific to disciplinary records of law enforcement personnel. So, for example, municipal police departments, county sheriff's offices, and community college public safety offices would use the item in our local government schedule that covers investigative records and disciplinary proceedings. Um, for those of you who want the specific item number, it's 637. And if you put a record of disciplinary action in the individual's personnel file, then you would also be looking at using the personnel case file item um, in the local government schedule, which is item 636. Um, for state agency law enforcement officers, including SUNY, um, we have a personnel case files item in the state general schedule, which is 90001. And related to disciplinary records are use of force reports. Um, a little over a year ago, State law require, uh, was established that requires that every police department and county sheriff's office report any occurrence in which a police officer or peace officer employed the use of force under certain circumstances. And uh, they're required to do to report to DCJS. So the reports themselves would be covered under item 1221 in the local government schedule, which is um, and specifically uh, part D, which is law enforcement reports um, that are incident-based, and it's a three-year retention period. And then for any records of any instances of use of force that are further investigated and heard before a citizen review board, that would be covered under that item 637, um, the investigative records and disciplinary proceedings. So that covers um, those topics. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dennis. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, just the Dennis slide. I'm going to provide a really brief uh, high-level overview of the new local government retention schedule, the LGS-1. Uh, this has combined the four uh, pre previous schedules into one. So if you were using the MU1 or the CO2, uh, those are being phased out with the new LGS-1. This has eliminated duplication and inconsistencies that cropped up over time across the schedules. And hopefully it will allow us at the State Archives to update the schedule on a more frequent basis. Uh, the 
functional section headings have largely remained the same. Uh, so there is still the public safety section and the probation section, but it includes sections that are likely not relevant to law enforcement, such as the school district or the county clerk section. Um, the numbers have changed, so if you got really familiar with the previous schedules and have memorized some of the items that are relevant to you, uh, I'm sorry to say that you will have to relearn the numbers. However, in the schedule, we have created what I think is an easy way to cross-reference those numbers. The, the old numbers are embedded in the new retention uh, items so that if you need to cross-reference, you have a box in inactive storage and you want to make sure that the new item is reflected, uh, you can do that, I think, fairly easily. Um, because of the volume of revisions, we have just flagged the major ones. So these include changes to retention periods, new items or sub-items, and any substantial rewording of an item. Uh, minor revisions include fixes to spelling, grammar, and punctuation, updating references, or adding some clarifying language that doesn't directly affect retention. And we do have a summary document on our website that runs through all those major revisions. Uh, most importantly, all local governments must adopt the new schedule by January 1st, 2021. That's when authority to use the previous schedules formally lapsed. And again, this is where uh, having that conversation with your uh, local government's overall records management officer would be helpful because the adoption needs to happen by your governing board, in essence. And I know just from my contacts with local governments, this has been happening. So if you don't know whether or not your town, village, or county, or local government unit has adopted it yet, um, again, that's a great opportunity to raise records management with your colleagues. Uh, so with that, I'm going to try to share my screen and give a little uh, demo of the searchable web feature. We do have uh, a searchable printable PDF version on our website, and we hope uh, by the end of this month, uh, we just had a meeting about this yesterday, so we're on track maybe by the end of this week to have some spreadsheets and an access database available as well. Again, if you want to manipulate the information for an office schedule or for some other need. But we're really excited about the web feature. Uh, let me share my browser. Um, I assume you can see that, Jennifer? Yes, I can now. Okay. I know in past uh, webinars, uh, this hasn't always worked. If you haven't checked out our State Archives website, please do. It's got a lot of great information, not just about old records and New York State history, but also about managing records. Um, if you go to the Managing Records menu, you will hopefully notice the Retention and Disposition Schedules option, and then you will scroll down. Uh, you can skip over state agency information, because today we're just talking about local governments. Uh, we have a model resolution form. If you go to your records management officer and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, you can point him or her to the resolution that we suggest you use to adopt the schedule. Uh, we have uh, the list of major revisions right there. And then a little bit further down is the actual LGS-1, which a lot of good uh, introductory information as to the effective date, uh, we issued this on August 1st, but again, your local government needs to adopt it before you can formally implement it. And then on the left-hand side, we have this menu of uh, functional headings. And sort of uh, discreetly at the top is search the schedule. So I know one of the 
big questions we always get is video. You can just put in video for that search, and you get a whole slew of potential things. But I'm going to scroll all the way down. Oh, i got to go to page two for public safety, and we have these two uh, items that say uh, video or audio recording of booking or arresting processing. If your department or agency records those, or recordings taken from mobile and stationary units. And if you want to see more about that, you just click on the arrow to expand it, and it gives you more details um, where it says if the recording relates to a specific case investigation, it does need to be retained as long as the case investigation, which is actually covered by a different item. And if it's just a recording that does not re relate to a specific investigation, the retention is six months. Um, you can see that this item was uh, involved in what we considered a major revision by this diamonds mark, and I think that's uh, mostly because we expanded uh, the scope of this one to involve other types of video recordings. Oh, that's just... Uh, the new item is 1281, and then we have the cross-reference on the right to the previous number, so in the county... CO2 schedule is 961 in the municipality, and the one schedule is 825, and for miscellaneous governments in the MI1, it was 834. And that's a really quick uh, rundown. I think the search is pretty simple. We've gotten some really good feedback. Oh, I will just say if you were did the search and you weren't quite happy with it, but you wanted to see what other law enforcement uh, miscellaneous uh, type items that were, you can click on that link and that brings you to the subsection in the public safety section, which gives you a whole sort of um, uh, retention items, including we see we've made some major revision to the alcohol and drug testing records and another revision to the missing person records. And, and the like. But if you wanted to start from, you didn't want to do a search and you just wanted to browse, again, we have the public safety section uh, linked all the way down here. And this subsection menu is also new. So if you just wanted to focus on uh, law enforcement, personal property, for example, um, you can click there and see the retention items we've developed related to that function. So that's what I have for the live demo. Hopefully it worked well on your end. Uh, let me go back to meeting window. Um, I think the next couple of slides, oh no. Now we're back to you, Jennifer. Um, to go into some of the the nitty-gritty details of the change in terms of public safety and law enforcement. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, the demo worked out really well. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, public safety first, and then next I'll talk about probation um, section. So these are the major changes that were made um, to the public safety section. Uh, we updated the outdated references um, from NYSPIN to the eJustice New York Integrated Justice Portal. Um, we added a new item to cover all of that information that you may have in your E911 or CAD system on handicapped persons and residents, um, building access or hazards uh, for certain structures, the presence of dangerous animals, the location of firearms, ammunition, and hazardous materials, and we also um, added a sub, or ha ha also have an item, um, a sub item as part of this that covers routine information like name changes, that sort of thing. Um, we work with DCJS staff to update the accreditation records item. It had been a permanent retention period, which seemed overly long to us, and. So uh, we 
basically set assessment reports, annual compliance surveys, uh, that sort of thing um, at a 10-year retention period. And then information that's needed every time you renew your accreditation, um, and presumably these are copies um, of things uh, for demonstrating compliance with the program, those have a, a zero after accreditation period ends or is renewed. We also updated the training records item. Um, if you remember in the past, we just had everything, uh, basically all the training materials in one sub-item for a 50-year retention period, but we broke that up into um, training materials that address core law enforcement um, with a 40-year retention period, and then training materials with that address general public safety issues or non-core activities with a one-year retention period. And any materials that DCJS produces um, is zero after no longer needed um, because presumably DCJS will be keeping a copy of those. We also added some new items including um, one uh, to cover bike helmet inspection records, uh, one for ride-along program records, those both have a three-year retention period, and a new item to cover community outreach and education program records, things like drug and alcohol prevention, citizen youth police academy, neighborhood watch, and other crime prevention programs. Um, and that has a six-year retention period. So next slide, Dennis. Um, we visited a number of different uh, police departments and found that the definition of a police slaughter varied depending on where we went. And their uh, police slaughter is not legally defined anywhere. So we reworded the item to make it clear. So um, basically any incident, complaint, or arrest summary records or logs um, that are not submitted to DC, DCJS must be kept permanently. Um, if any copies that you have of information that's submitted reports or data that's submitted to DCJS would be covered under our law enforcement reports item. We got a lot of questions um, over the years about what do we mean when we have a retention event that says case closure. So we defined what that meant. A case is closed if it results in prosecution and appeals are exhausted, if it results in a settlement, if it results in no arrest, or when restitution is no longer sought. We also got questions about should the crime be classified on um, the initial charge or what the final disposition of the case is. Um, and we determined that it should be based on the crime or offense that an individual is convicted of or pleads to, so the final dis disposition of the case. Um, recently, the Child Victims Act uh, changed the statute of limitations on child sexual abuse crimes to age 28 for criminal cases and age 55 to civil cases. Um, it also created a one-year window for survivors, which I believe has been extended. Um, and so we, inc or we established a sub-item under the case investigation file item um, that covers sex offenses against a child as defined in Child Victims Act. And the retention period is um, zero after the child attains age 55. Um, there's also a child abuse and maltreatment reports item, and we um, up the retention period for part of that to age 55. We also added aggravated sexual assault in the uh, sexual abuse in the first degree or course of sexual contact 
conduct against a child in the first degree to Part A of the case investigation record item. And if you recall, um, Part A includes those crimes uh, that have no statute of limitations, including homicide, um, so that has a permanent retention period now. Um, next slide. We also, across all of the schedules, made a life expectancy retention period consistent, so it's set at 90 years. So there's a couple of items that have changed in this section. Um, federal law limits release and use of personal information from state motor vehicle records, and government agencies are permitted access for legitimate business reasons, but any authorized recipient um, must keep a record um, of who they've shared that information with for five years. So we added a new item to cover these. DMV photo request records with a five-year retention period. The New York State SAFE Act prompted a number of changes to the um, firearms licensing item, which we also added um, a mention of pistol permits to it because uh, we've gotten a lot of confusion over the years as to where the pistol permits item is located. Um, so the New York State Act requires recertification um, for pistol permits and uh, renewals uh, for uh, licenses um, in downstate counties. Uh, so we added uh, language to the um, retention events that took recertification and renewal into consideration. We also added a note and an item in the public access to records section that any license holders that do not want their information released publicly um, may apply for a FOIL exemption um, uh, to that. So that has a three year after exemption is null and void uh, retention period. And then we added a sub item for incomplete applications which can be destroyed after 90 days. Uh, we increased the retention period for traffic and parking violations from two years to three years. Um, we expanded the results of alcohol and drug test item to include two new sub-items that cover records pertaining to the verification and maintenance of breath analysis instruments and standards and calibration, quality control, and testing records for other types of equipment. And we modeled that on the speed timing records, which is an existing item. Next slide. Um, we added a new item to cover criminal background checks that police departments run for employment purposes. And not to be confused with the missing persons item. Um, can you still hear me? Um, not to be <laughs> sorry, my uh, my uh, screen uh, went uh, it, it froze. Um, not to be confused with the missing persons item that's in the investigation case file item that has a permanent retention. This has been a separate item and a source of confusion. This basically covers um, missing persons uh, uh, that instances where another um, agency has jurisdiction. So the lead agency would would hold on to missing persons records under the investigation item um, and the, uh, the other jurisdiction would hold it under this item. And we adjusted the retention period on this as well. Um, as Dennis mentioned, we clarified the existing um, law enforcement records, um, specifically the mobile and stationary units, to cover things like body-worn cameras, um, video surveillance, video cameras. Uh, we also added um, uh, some clarity to the speed timing records item to uh, cover traffic enforcement cameras, um, which would include license plate readers. 
And then we added um, a new item to cover confidential uh, in information received, like from a TIPS hotline, and a new item to cover transportation records uh, for mental health um, admissions. Next slide. So um, next, I'm going to cover the major changes um, under the probation section. Um, basically, we added a new item to cover sex offender records, um, and this is basically aggravated data that is separate from individual um, sex offender data that's found in the probation client case files item. We added a new item to cover lists of probationers and other clients, uh, which is similar to the list of registered sex offenders uh, maintained by probation departments. And we added a new item to cover probation-related reports, studies, or data entries, um, or da data queries, rather. Um, so annual summary reports would be kept permanently, and every other type of report would be a lesser retention period. Um, we added a new item to cover probation client data systems, which most um, probation departments appear to have now. Uh, and we set a permanent retention for summary data on every individual um, and then kept a 10-year retention period for the, the remaining information about an individual, and that 10-year retention period matches that of the um, case files item. We added two new sub-items to the case files item to cover results, um, basically uh, negative results uh, uh, of drug tests um, that aren't filed as part of the case file. And we also uh, added a sub-item to cover monitoring records for ignition interlock devices. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, the changes to the public safety and probation section. Thank you, Jennifer. And that is the substance of what we have for you today. Uh, this is a colorful representation of the regional advisors. Out in western New York, my colleague Sarah Durling is holding down the fort. In central New York, staying steady in the center is Michael Martin. Uh, the capital district in North Country is Maria McCashin. And on our southern flank, my colleague Lorraine Hill has the metro New York City and Long Island region. And myself, Dennis Riley, I have the privilege of serving the 11 counties that make up the Hudson Valley and Catskills. I know um, uh, my colleague Sarah, who has been troubleshooting the chat along, has also included the link to all our contact information. As I hopefully stress, we are available to help support your needs, uh, whether that is answering questions about retention, doing more specialized training, again, whether through the MPTC or specific to your department or your local government. Uh, we're available to meet with you and discuss what you're up against uh, in the age of COVID. Uh, those meetings are more and more uh, virtually and online, but if you absolutely need an in-person visit, uh, talk to us and we'll see how we can, uh, again, meet your needs. Uh, with that, uh, we have time to answer some questions. Um, Sarah, I saw, I have not been keeping up with the chat. I did see one question towards the end. Uh, Jennifer, for body cameras, et cetera, is there a proper procedure on how to dispose of those records when they are eligible? Um, I know our blanket sense is that the state archives does not prescribe a specific uh, discussion method, uh, but that such records should be destroyed in their entirety. So whether it's, uh, if it's electronic media, um, speaking with your IT uh, experts as to how uh, and what are the best current methods, whether it's degaussing or if it's stored on magnetic tape, how do you fully and completely delete those types of records. I don't know, Jennifer, if you have additional thoughts on that. 
Um, well, just to uh, point out that um, they need to be, if if they're, they relate to a specific case investigation, you want to make sure that they're set aside and properly secured so that they can be used for legal purposes. And you'll want to retain those as long as the case investigation to which they relate. If it doesn't relate to a specific case investigation, um, then it only needs to be kept for six months. But as Dennis mentioned at the beginning, you'll want some sort of policies and procedures for documenting records disposition. Uh, we do have some sample disposition forms um, that you can uh, request from your REO and uh, you can model those to fit your own needs. It looks like we have a question. Can you go over the use of force record retention one more time? Sure. So um, use of force reports could be covered under the local government, um, the LGS-1 item number 1221, Part D. So that is covers law enforcement reports and specifically Part D covers incident-based reports or queries, and it has a three-year retention period. If, if there are instances of use of force that are further investigated, and some of those might be heard before a citizen review board, those would be covered under item 637, which covers investigative records and disciplinary proceedings. And that has a retention period of three years after final decision is rendered. Okay. And we have a question about training academy. Uh, uh, in particular, how long to keep records related to training outside agencies, so I guess external third parties. So are you – so – if if it is training that you as an employee received from an outside training academy, then um, it would be covered under um, probably in the personnel section. I I don't I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I, actually, let me I sort of garbled the the phrasing they they wrote uh, suppose. Uh, how long are training academy supposed to keep records from an outside agency we have trained? So much okay. Coming from a, someone who, who works for a training academy. Yeah, so you're training people who aren't necessarily part of your government. That's how I'm understanding um, the question. Yeah, and I'm just looking back at the training items to see um, how we worded it. So I think that this item would cover it um, because um, it says, uh, part of it says you're keeping an individual's record of courses attended and or completed, including basic information on course content. So um, you'll need to hold on to um, that information for six years after the individual leaves service and hold on to training materials um, as well. Um, I think we'll need to readdress this item um, because obviously it's going to be uh, difficult for you to know when the individual leaves service. Um, so uh, that's a good question, and we will take another look at this item to make sure we address your specific question. So thank you. And we have a question that our county central police services holds the storage of our digital police reports. I keep hard copies of the, the reports. We have a letter from the county stating that they are the holder of those records. We 
have the county issue a letter every year, or will the original letter cover us? Um, I'm trying to understand what the letter that the county is the holder of the records. I mean, I would guess that in terms of meshes with your overall policies, that the, the original letter probably is sufficient, Jennifer. If, if it's not something that changes on an annual basis, the having an annual recertification, again, not fully understanding the context, wouldn't be bad practice, whether it's actually necessary. Um, I guess it would also depend on how much turnover and institutional memory there is. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's kind of like a storage contract of sorts. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they're also disposing of records um, on behalf of the um, police department, um, but um, if they are disposing of records on behalf of the police department, then you'll need to make sure that that is worked out in advance and that um, uh, records disposition is documented and uh, the police department gets a copy of of that information? I would also say that's a great uh, topic to raise with your regional advisor, uh, just to start a con if you don't have a relationship with, with myself or whoever my colleague covers your county. Um, it would be a great opportunity to sort of introduce yourself and just sort of broach the topic and we can sort of perhaps provide more specific guidance. Um, and we have, we're a little bit over the hour, but we have at least one more question, Jennifer, back to training, law enforcement training records. Uh, is there a definition of what constitutes, quote, core law enforcement activities, unquote, that must be kept for 40 years? Um, well, you, Dennis, you helped uh, uh, work on uh, drafting this item, not to throw you under the bus, um, but I think we were trying to come up with language that kind of um, made a distinction between, um, like, basic uh, law enforcement tactics and strategies yeah. versus, like, you know, um, something like today's training, which is like routine kind of records management activities. It's, it's important to, um, for police to know about records management, but it's not a core law enforcement function or activity. Um, so we're trying, this is, this is the dilemma we have. We're trying to, um, make it broad use broad enough language to cover um, a bunch of different types of records that um, a department might hold or different types of training. And so it it, it is um, sometimes hard to pin down exactly what we, we mean. Um, but if you have some examples you want to run by us, you know, we'd be happy to, to look at them and give you our opinion. And, and I'm happy to chime in because I thought this sounded familiar, um, and I believe that phrase is, uh, for better or worse, my creation. Uh, there's nothing in law, you know, often um, retention requirements are not spelled out specifically in law, for better or worse. And so, as Jennifer mentioned, we were trying to come up with some general blanket category that would make the distinction between training that would impact law enforcement activities, procedures, versus, say, you have, uh, I know for us, we have annual IT security training or annual sexual harassment training or annual fiscal management training that is not core to perhaps how you go about and implement 
uh, and enforce the law and protect and serve the communities you operate in. So that was perhaps the generic and imprecise terminology we kind of came up with. And hopefully that, between what Jennifer said and what I say, kind of makes sense. Um, uh, we're still getting questions, so Jennifer, I'm happy to continue trying to field some of these. Um, we have one more, um, not quite sure, 1280 specific, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, item 1280, uh, specifically acts on that body camera. Generally the retention has been 30, 120, and evidence. Does this update mean all routine axon activations are now six months unless an arrest takes place? So, yeah, the short answer is yes. And this six months, six month retention period is the same as it was um, previously. And uh, the uh, CO2, the MU1, the MI1, um, and ED1 schedules. So it hasn't changed. We simply clarified that particular item for mobile and stationary cameras. Um, to specifically mention body cameras, but it it is still a six month retention period. Okay, I think we've run through the questions that I've been able to track. Um, so we'll wrap this up. Thank you everyone for joining us. If you had more than one person join today, if you can put that in the chat just so we can get some sense of statistics. I've been doing a head count as we've gone along. And again, thank you so much. Uh, our hope is that this is a start of a more in-depth dialogue with law enforcement uh, community as to the records management challenges and opportunities you face. We know about records management. We don't necessarily know about the ins and outs of day-to-day -day law enforcement practices. So by all means, stay in touch with us, uh, stay in touch with your regional advisor, help us help you. And with that, I thank you for your time.